want to begin, I'm going to ask these guys a couple of questions, and then, I, then we want to open up and let you guys ask some questions. But I'm going to take the prerogative and ask each of you a few questions first. And first of all, uh, as I mentioned before, you've been to Israel twice, once when you were 13 and once when you were 16. And now you're here, you've got uh, your daughters here. W just tell us a little bit about your impressions, and we'll get into Joel again, but we'll give people a break from Joel for a few moments, and let's talk about just your impressions of being back in Israel after all these years. You know, it's Not hard. all these years, I mean a few years. It's hard. <laughs> 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 I didn't mean any offense. How, communicate, how we communicate is very important. <laughs> Not just what we communicate. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> right. Sorry. Uh, no, the gray hair just speaks for itself, so it's okay. But um, I, I don't know how to pull out a highlight. My, daughter, my two daughters are with me, and we have wept our way through this beautiful land. And I would pull out one highlight, maybe, that, that it struck me. We are on the Sea of Galilee, and we got to a little place on the shore, and nobody was there. So we were able to have devotions um, just privately. And I went through the John 21 when Jesus recalled Peter to discipleship, when he had gone back fishing. And I feel like he had gone back to his old way of life, because he, after his failure, he just felt like he couldn't be a disciple. And then when he saw Jesus, remember I dove overboard and he ran to Jesus because it was like, Jesus, I, I don't want to go back, but I don't know if I can go forward. I just want to, you back in my life. And, um, and then how Jesus recalled him. And the thing that struck me is that Jesus is still calling disciples today. And I want to be a disciple. I don't want to be a pew sitter, a bench warmer, somebody who's mediocre, complacent, apathetic, sort of your... Sorry, average church member. <laughs> I want to be, a, and I don't want to be just one of the 12, and I don't want to just be one of the three. I want to be the beloved disciple. And so that's my goal. <laughs> yeah, and, um, well, as, uh, as James has tells us, right, you have not because you ask not, and, right. or we ask with impure motives, but that's not an impure motive. And you, and you have to be intentional. Amen. You know, so that it's not just something you ask mm. and he gives you, but... It means the way you spend your time, your priorities, what you do, that you're intentional about just putting him first and drawing near to him and um, just abandoning yourself to him. So, uh, so that was a, you know, there have been so many precious moments, but that was a precious moment that stands out. Amen. Wow. And I'm not surprised that it would be in Galilee. I mean, one of, it's really my favorite part of the land because it, it's so undeveloped. You really, I, I just feel like... You can see what Jesus saw, exactly. and you can just get a, a, a sense of it yeah. in a way oh, that's. You know, you I love Jerusalem, but I, I love being the up in the galley. Feel the sea and hear the ocean, and the yeah. sea, and hear the birds. I mean, you you know that there's some things yeah. that were common that we could experience. Yeah. The experience. That's very powerful. Ray, you've uh, you have this burning mm -hmm. passion in you to mm -hmm. get this message spread yes. out uh, uh, to Jerusalem from Jerusalem, mm -hmm. and you couldn't even let lunch pass. Without, uh, not that we have something to announce, but just your passion is to take this message all over. What, yeah. Just share some of the things that you're thinking about these days. Um, I am just, uh, this is the, the dream, uh, you know, of my life. I, what, what got me excited when I was a young believer, I mean, I, I got saved uh, when I was 11, watching your dad, Billy Graham. And uh, I, was in, I was the only one. They gave an invitation, a church rented a theater, showed a Billy Graham film did all this advertising, then they gave the invitation, and there was only one person who came forward. It was me. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. So, for, all, you know, for all those who have done efforts, and oh, only one little kid came forward. You know, it was worth it for me. <laughs> yeah. But, um, yeah, that's we, a, that, uh, just for one second, TiVo that thought, because, you know, so, no, but sometimes, sometimes, even when we're doing things that, we're, that are right in the Lord, sometimes we can get caught up in numbers. And we don't think about how, and, and we can get discouraged by one person, all that effort and all that. But, you know, how could they have imagined mm. the, how the Lord would use you to take the gospel message and make disciples and train pastors and plant churches all around the world? And, you know, if one person came out of this room with a passion to walk yes. with Jesus no matter what, and was as fruitful as you know, just you have been or each one of you, this would it's worth be it. worth all of it. Yeah. So pick up with that thought, but I mean, well, I just want to note it, so, especially. So with that, when, when I was a young believer, um, and I started in the Nazarene Church and then the Wesleyan Church before I got into Calvary Chapel, and, but I, I heard all, you know, that Jesus was coming back, and I, 
I just, that put a fire in my heart at 14 years old. I started sharing my faith. Uh, you know, I heard a lot of other things, but when I heard I could be living in the generation Jesus is coming back, I've never been the same hmm. until this day. Hmm. And I, I just have a fire. Well, what was it about this day that changed it? <laughs> oh, wait, no, I see. Oh, I see. <laughs> oh, wow. this day you changed? Oh, man. Joel. Great. Sorry. Oh, wow. <laughs> you're no, that's good. That's you're good. killing me, Smalls. Uh, no, but I, you know, and, and then I would say about 10 years, I've been coming like, like Skip. Uh, you know, we take tours and we bring people here all the time and I love walking through. I still, I fall in love with Israel, but about 10 years ago, uh, to, to summarize, you know, a download from the Holy Spirit and put it into words, the Lord spoke to me and he said, Ray, you're treating Israel like a watch, like a clock on the wall. What time is it? What time is it? I'm coming. Oh, this is great. And all that passion, he said, that's all good. He said, but I, uh, Israel is more than a clock on the wall. There's people here. And, and, and some of them are my own brothers and sisters. And I love them. And I want, this is the phrase that, he, you know, he gave me. He said, you, you tell the story, you study the story, you teach the story, you preach the story. I'm asking you to step into the story. Mm -hmm. So 10 years ago, I was like, I, I want to get off, you know, I, I know the bus driver and the tour guide. And now that's led me to Ariel with Ron Nachman. It's led me to the Nazareth village and the, the school that's there with our Arab believer brothers there. It's led me to Tasa Ada in Jericho. It's led me with you and now with Ann and Skip here. And, and I'm just having the time of my life, you know? It's just unbelievable. So it's a I've stepped into the yeah. story. And, yeah. and I want to bring as many people as I can. We're in the story. We're not just telling the story and teaching the story. We're in the story. Yeah. And it's awesome. Amen. Amen. Skip, you are on the... Uh, an interesting journey just in terms of, you know, your passion to Israel goes back to college and how many times you've been here. Um, but you're also, uh, you've also been applying your own passion for Israel in, in some new ways in recent years and even recent months and weeks. Just tell us, give us an update on kind of what the process you've been going through as a pastor. How do you process all this truth and, and apply it? Yeah, I, I guess I, I wouldn't be a normal fit, Joel. Somebody like you grew, grew up with a Jewish dad I could, you know, we would understand the fit. For me, I'm, I'm a German Gentile. There's really no reason that I would have an affinity for I Israel with my uh, heritage and my background. But it was from reading the Bible and discovering the God of the Bible and his priorities that led me to this land. So when I first came to Israel, I came to live on a kibbutz and to work and see it from the eyes of a, of a local. And uh, I fell in love with the land, but I fell in love with the people of the land. I just thought... Here is an, uh, a very industrious, self-sacrificing group of people, you know, hardworking. It sort of reminded me of what I had read about early America and how devoted we were to, to making something of a country. And, and, and Israel came here very impoverished. And um, the Lord has blessed them. But with that came a, a heart for the land that God has a covenant with, the Abrahamic covenant, etc. But in more recent years... And especially last year when I brought a tour, um, something changed in me, Joel, that uh, has been a little bit more fulfilled on this trip. And that is when I went to Bethlehem, and it's not easy to get to Bethlehem with that wall and checkpoint. And we went there, and I, I noticed it was a little more depressed, a little more run down, a little more soiled. The people's attitudes were more in the dumps. And, and understandably so because of the wall. I understand the security issues and I, I can sympathize with that, but I also started sympathizing with those living um, in, in those areas and I got to thinking, what about the church Christians that are here? What about the pastors that are here? And I just sort of thought, shame on me for just waking up to that fact now. And I just thought, I would like to meet some Palestinian believers and Palestinian pastors because you know what? They're brothers in Christ. doesn't matter politically what side we're on. They're brothers in the Lord. How can I encourage them or strengthen their churches? So um, on this trip, uh, thankfully, you got us in touch with, and a friend of mine in Jordan who's a pastor, I wrote to him and told him my intentions, and he got me in touch with uh, some leaders in the area, and we made connections. And, you know, I just think what you just said in that last message was so important and ought to resonate. It certainly did with me. Um, uh, for that very reason, that here you've got a group of people um, living in an area where they're not loved that
that much by Israelis, not loved that much by Muslims because they're Christians, not loved that much by people in the West. So they sort of feel like the man without a country. And I thought, um, just like the man from Macedonia who said, come over to Macedonia and help us, that uh, there's a call even in this land right on the other side of that wall or those walls of brothers saying, come over here and help us. And next time you're in the land, why not like spend some time with us? So it was helpful for me, and I really enjoyed the time getting to know them. Mm, amen. I appreciate you guys' heart. Okay, we'll start up at the top. Hi, uh, my name is Laura Whitehead, Montgomery, Alabama. Hi. Um, I just have a question for any one of you. Um, my question is, what's one way or some way since you've been interacting a whole bunch more than we have with um, Middle East Christians that they view the world and how they think about the world and Christianity? Uh, because I know that they think differently uh, than Western society. And so with that, how can we better see the world by understanding Middle East Christians and Middle East Christianity yeah. that way? It's a great question. Well, uh, well I'll start, but uh, feel free to, to dive in. Um, first, uh, Jewish believers in Jesus uh, don't think of themselves as Christians. Now, don't, not theologically. Obviously, they're Christ followers. Uh, but there is a real, uh, it's, it's important to know the, the cultural uh, dissonance uh, when, they, when a Jewish person thinks, okay, now after all my people have rejected, you know, and pretty much Jesus and, and Christians have been, some of them have been cruel to us over the years, and now I believe that Jesus is the Messiah, and I'm going to become a follower, but does that mean I'm changing religions? Does that mean I'm changing? Now, your heart has to change. There's absolutely no way around repentance, but am I becoming a Christian? Now, in, in a, you know, obviously in a, in a technical, biblical sense, you are, and yet... Where were the first followers of Jesus called Christians? It wasn't in the land. It was in Syria, in Antioch. Mm. So it really, Christians uh, is a term uh, primarily thought of as, as a Gentile phrase to describe a follower of Jesus Christ. And for a Jewish person, uh, they would call themselves, there's a range of different things. It used to be a Hebrew Christian or a Jewish Christian, but then Jews thought, well, we're not really Christians. I mean, we are theologically. I mean, don't again, don't misunderstand that. But this is, but but you Gentiles are coming into the faith, and that's the, that's the term you're using. But we who it was supposed to be our faith from the beginning, a Jewish Messiah, salvation comes from the Jews, uh, and for the Jews, um, then it became a new range from Jewish believer in Jesus is a phrase I like to use. Uh, some would call the Messianic uh, Jewish believers. So there's a that's one of the perspectives that because. Every taunt that a non-believing Jewish person is going to say of a Jewish believer in Jesus is, you're, you're changing religions. When in fact we are embracing the very Jewish Messiah that came for us. And okay, our team didn't get it so much the first time around, but we want to get it the second time around. And so uh, that's just one angle on that as a sensitivity. And even, you know, even our own staff, we sometimes we, we catch ourselves saying, you know, oh, that, uh, um, you know, uh, we would love it if Jewish people became Christians. And we think, well, okay, followers of Jesus uh, as the Messiah. And so it's just, you know, it's, it's not just a semantic. It, it's about understanding the culture of Jewish believers here and how God is increasingly putting a spotlight on the church here. Uh, and by the way, they don't call them churches either. That's a, just a little extra FYI because the church has a, I mean, you know, believers here are, 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 are um, very mature and very strong in their faith, and so they understand they're part of the larger church. But, but the church also rings badly in the ear of a Jewish believer because of the history of persecution by so-called Christians. Uh, so they would call them, uh, I attend a kehila, uh, that's a congregation or a fellowship, and that's uh, just one other nuance of being you know, sensitive to the culture of the believers here. I don't know if you guys have other thoughts you want to add into any of that. I don't know much from uh, that kind of perspective, but I do know that you can get your worldview from Scripture, and that when you read your Bible, the Bible wasn't written just for American Southern white Protestants. <laughs> uh, the Bible As was a Northern a, yeah. white Jew, that's good. <laughs> 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 Amen, sister. <laughs> but uh, this is God's word, and it's a supernatural book. It's um, you know translated by a team of scholars. I heard Joel answer that question Friday, mm -hmm. I think it was, which was great. And um, and so it's God's word, and and so there's some things that God will teach us in His word that apply to all people. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like when we saturate ourselves in scripture, yeah. he gives us a hard understanding 
We know that person is empty, whoever he is, without Jesus. We know that person has a longing for God. We, we went to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre yesterday, and to see people on their face kissing this rock, and I thought, you know, it just broke my heart because I thought they're longing for God. They want to be near him, you know, and, and that's true of people all over the world. So I, I feel like, for me, not having this is my third trip and the other two a long time ago, I wouldn't have the perspective that you all do, but I do know something about my Bible and that right. God's word is God's word for the whole world and that we can mm -hmm. believe the principles and, and we can live by it and also impart it to people and know it's going to speak because it's for them too. Amen. Maybe in that, if you, unless you guys have a specific thing, if you wanted to share for a moment on going to Iraq and maybe you to Lebanon, mm -hmm. just in terms of understanding the challenge of being a Christian in this part of the world. Uh, unless you have something else, I mean, that's fine. I mean, No, I, I mean, I was invited by Joel. He said, hey, I, I'm going to be going to Iraq. And, and that, that was like, wow, I mean, that's where Abraham came from. That's where it all started. Um, and I, I asked him, I said, is, is it safe to go there? Do you guys, do you have like soldiers and stuff? And he, he goes, no. Uh, he goes, really, we're just going to uh, go trust in the Lord. And... Um, <laughs> He says, and I am bringing my 11-year-old son. I go, oh, yeah, 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 no problem. Yeah, I'll go. <laughs> so, but we were there, and uh, to meet uh, these believers in Iraq, um, I mean, the, the, the leader of uh, the, the ministry there, what's it, it's not, can't, it's, well, that's right. Uh, the name? Yeah, Life Agape. Life Agape. Uh, he said virtually every single day, every single day, someone is coming and knocking on the door of a church, it may be an Orthodox church, it may be a Catholic church, it may be an independent church, saying, I had a dream about Jesus. Please, can you help me? And some of those, some of those churches are equipped to know, and some of them and don't know how to help you know, that person or sadly, even want to. We, do, we need to pray because, uh, yeah, the, the, he also told me sometimes the church there, nominal, out of fear will say, no, you have your religion, go back, and then they stay. But they, you know, God graciously will bring them to someone, but um, we, boy, we need to, you know, I just felt compelled to go there and to visit them, and we went through the, the book of Philippians, and just with the, yeah, these, oh, with one guy that was a former terrorist who had the most radical vision, <laughs> a, a dream of Jesus, and I got to meet him. I felt honored. I, you know, I feel like he, he is a, he's a hero. And, and Dr. Koshi was, has been there and discipled him. And he is leading people to the Lord. His wife, he led his wife to the Lord. His wife's dad is a mullah who then said, I'm going to kill. If you don't divorce him, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill your husband. I'm going to, you know. And he's like, he's so bold now. As he had that, you know, he was a terrorist before with boldness. And he doesn't fear death. He goes, now I don't, I don't care. I don't fear death. And he's leading, he's leading Muslim after Muslim after Muslim to Jesus Christ in Iraq. Amen. Amen. Skip? Yeah, I was, uh, to follow up, piggyback on that, I was uh, invited to Lebanon, as Joel mentioned, a couple years ago to do a conference. A friend of mine uh, who's a, it's Paul the Apostle in Lebanon, Sammy Dagger, uh -huh. an amazing man of God, amazing man of faith. I've been to Baghdad with him and Babylon. But we were invited to his church, the Carantina Church in Lebanon, and he brought in pastors from uh, Syria, from Lebanon, from Jordan, from Egypt, uh, Syria, countries all around, men and women who are laboring among Muslim communities, lots of persecution. Uh, for a time of encouragement, uh, Ravi Zacharias and myself were teaching that conference. But the, the kind of faith that I put it, put it this way, I walk away from that more encouraged than anything I could ever give to anyone mm. because of the way they live their faith out in these places. Mm. And, and they love the camaraderie, they love the encouragement, and they love people coming to visit them and give them, teach them. But uh, the way they live their faith out is, it's, put it this way, God is moving. If you never thought, if you thought, oh, that happened a long time ago and yeah. now God's moving in the West, I'd say, think again, we could use some of them over in our country as missionaries. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that's Joel chapter 2, coming to pass, or uh, all that we're talking about. Yeah, Jeremy, you've got someone there? Hi, I'm Carol Clark from Sarasota, Florida, and I wanted to ask, really, how you would advise Benjamin Netanyahu right now, because he's under such scrutiny that he's 
slowing down the process and all of that, and it seems that everybody is so sympathetic to the Palestinians and to Abbas. And as you read, Joel, um, verse 3-3, it struck me that it was like a foregone conclusion, and they divided the land. Like, is it going to happen? So how would you advise Benjamin Netanyahu? What could he be doing to perhaps <laughs> stop this? Wow. Um, well, my first instinct is to say that I've gone through political detox. I'm out. I'm clean. I'm not advising anyone politically. <laughs> You know, I, you know, I was on his team to come back, uh, you know, nine, ten years ago, and he didn't come back with anything that I did. Uh, so, just also, we we sent him a letter to say, "Hey, we're going to be here. We'd love to sit down with you." And I finally had to call the office and say, "Listen, we didn't even get an answer." <laughs> so, oh well. But I said, "Look, we love you guys anyway. Uh, we don't. Need, we'd prefer an answer, even if it's no. But but anyway, we love uh, whoever's going to serve as prime minister because we're supposed to pray for those in authority." But setting aside the humor, I, I would say um, this message has to be shared, has to be lovingly shared, and has to be firmly and clearly shared. Judgment is coming to those who divide the land. I think you're right. I think the analysis of Joel chapter 3 indicates it will be divided. And of course, prophetically, we know it will be divided. First of all, it already has been divided yes. multiple times throughout history and multiple times just since 1947. I mean, the famous... 1947 UN <coughs> moment, which most people say is this was the positive moment, was a UN partition plan. Okay, they just said it right out there. We're dividing the land. You know, um, I'm gonna cut the baby in half, and we'll give it. You know, one side. And and the Jews said yes, and of course the Arab states said no, and that's what led to the war. In 1967, uh, Israel, you know, won the war very quickly and surprisingly, and reunified Jerusalem and got Judea and Samaria and the Sinai and the Golan Heights and then said, okay, now we've won, but let's sit down and talk peace. And unfortunately, the Arab world and Palestinians in particular issued the three no's. No peace, no recognition, no negotiation. So, you know, in 2000, um, at, at, uh, Prime Minister Ehud Barak at Camp David with President Clinton offered Yasser Arafat about 93 to 95%, there's differing views, of the West Bank, half of the old city of Jerusalem, and all of Gaza for a peace treaty. And Arafat said, well, if he's willing to give that much up, I guess I can get more. Came back here and started the second intifada. So many Israeli politicians on both sides, the, prime, the current prime minister included, um, feel it, it, it probably is a good idea to divide the land. The, the only question is how much and under what conditions a, that security could be reached. But I think the only fair thing to say at this point, whenever we meet Israeli or Arab leaders, is to just take them to Joel chapter 3 and say, listen, this may be difficult to hear, but you need to hear the word of the Lord, and that is he will judge all who divide the land. And we don't want to say it with... Anything but the, that is the word of God, and it's true, and we don't do anyone favors, including our friends, our Israeli friends, to say anything less than that. So um, I, I'm out of the political uh, advising business, but f teaching the word of God and sharing it with anyone, any leader at any level who will listen, um, this is what we need to say. Yeah. How aware are you of the abortion issues in Israel? I've been told that when young people serve mandatory military service that the government will pay for up to two abortions during that, during that time, and that the number of babies aborted in Israel is beginning to rival the Holocaust. This is a great, terrible tragedy in this country. I believe the estimate is about 50,000 abortions a year here in Israel. And you're, I, I believe you're accurate. I'm not sure if it's the number is two, but definitely at least one uh, if you're in the army. It, it's, it's, this is a horrible situation, and I, wish, I say that as a friend, as, as somebody who loves Israel, couldn't love Israel more than, I, than I'm aware of, knowing how to love Israel more. But one of the things that Joshua Fenton does is, is support pro-life ministries here. And when I say that, I mean there is no cultural resonance here for trying to teach that, though people are and should. But I mean helping single mothers make the decision to keep their children and then help them uh, with practical needs as they make that very difficult and countercultural decision, that's one of the things that Joshua Fund does because we care so much about life. Amen. Uh, yes. 
Yeah, I'm Ron from Lexington, Kentucky. Uh, I'd like to know how, you're, how we're supposed to deal with or how you're dealing with uh, the 2012 end time philosophy <laughs> or doomsday philosophy with the correct end time philosophy that we have. Or not philosophy, but our, our own Christian religion. You mean like the, 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 the movie? Yes, how you're Mayan, using it. Maybe how we can and, use know. it or something. Well, hey, I mean, apparently the rapture's you know, going to happen in a couple days, so... <laughs> For, why worry about 2012? I don't know. I'll, I'll let you guys start to work your way through on that. Maybe skip and we'll work this way. Well, f right. fortunately, first of all, we have an impeccable track record when it comes to prophecy. It's what sets the Bible apart from any other manuscript or document is God proves himself, his calling card, he puts it on the table, and he challenges other gods to do so in Isaiah, is look, I can tell the end from the beginning. Can any of you, if you can, put your money where you're idolatry is, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and they can't. So w when you look, for example, at just the prophecy in Daniel, the 70 weeks of Daniel, and the prophecy given to Daniel by the angel of the exact coming of Mashiach Nagi, the Messiah, the Prince, in Daniel 9, 25 and 26, is translated into from the going forth of the commandment to restore and rebuild Jerusalem till the Messiah, the Prince, will be in exact days 173,880 days, or 69 sevens from the time a commandment is given. Well, you can count those days from the commandment given by Artaxerxes Longimanus to the exact day when Jesus Christ came into Jerusalem, to the exact day. So, you know, these National Geographic specials of, you know, this text and this, uh, uh, ideology or Mayan temple, it's like, please, yawn session, give me a break. <laughs> they can't even hold a candle to the kind of prophetic fulfillment that we see in the scripture, and that's just one of many things that we have seen. You're living today in, in the land of proof. Israel's back in the land. Part of Ezekiel's been fulfilled. So, you know, when you see the fulfillment taken place, you know that the rest of the story, as uh, our famous radio friend likes to say, the rest of the story will be fulfilled as well. You know, I think that is awesomely right on. And um, I mean, we have, it's 100%, it's 100% 100% accurate. Um, the other thing, though, that I think about is, as you know, if you have family and your friends, here's, here's one thing, you know, in the book of Daniel, where the king, all of a sudden, I mean, he is really blaspheming God. He's got the vessels from the temple uh, that are gold, and he's got wine in them. He's drinking, and there's dancing and partying going on, and all of a sudden, a hand appears by itself writing on the wall. Meeny, meeny, tackle you, Parson. I always thought that was meeny, meeny, tickle the Parson. But anyway, that's another story. Um, <laughs> But anyway, <laughs> you're um, not the only one suffering jet lag. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, the thing is, <laughs> they all saw it. The kings who was blaspheming saw it. Uh, the, the leadership of Babylon saw it. They, they saw a supernatural sign. Everybody could see the handwriting on the wall, but nobody knew how to interpret it. And I think that's a good application of what's happening now. Everybody sees, and whether it's the economy, whether it's the environment, whether it's geopolitically, they see the handwriting on the wall, and they're scared. So they go to the Mayan thing. Uh, maybe you know, they're looking for ways to interpret it. We are the only ones that have the interpretation, like Daniel, through the Word of God. We have what they're so you know. If they're reading the Mayan calendar, go, yeah, well, that's uh, kind of interesting. But uh, but did you know that the Bible says? and then you just go to the Bible. So you don't even need to get into the Mayan thing, just maybe even God is using some of those things to, it just brings up and out their curiosity and interest, which you can then, with the word of God, say here's what it means, and, and point them to the word. Amen. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to make two comments. One is that Jesus said that you cannot know the day or the hour, but I'm convinced you can know the generation mm -hmm. because he said it's not to catch us like a thief in the night. And then he says the generation that sees these things take place will be the same generation that sees the end come. So, so I believe we can know the generation. And I believe, as I've said, it's my generation. And so I think in the invisible world, there's a lot of stuff going on. And I think that the enemy who knows his time is short would want to confuse the issue. So he brings up this 
crazy guy in America right now who says, actually, Jesus is coming on my birthday this year, May 21st. Oh. <laughs> yeah, 2011, Jesus is supposed to come back on October 21st. The whole world's supposed to blow up in a fiery inferno. According, I mean, it's just wild. And I thought, why in the world? And he has billboards everywhere. He has cars yeah. painted with it. He's on TV, and there are articles in the paper. And somebody's got a lot of money behind that. What in the world is going on? Mm -hmm. And I think it's the enemy. So then when I come out and say, I believe time is short, People laugh, you know, right. well, you're like that coop that's got the car right. painted, whatever, you know, and so <laughs> right, it's like right. a, just yes. sort of like right. smoke screen, that's smoke right. and mirrors, and the mm -hmm. enemy is trying to confuse the issue that Jesus is coming, and it's soon, and I believe it's in this generation. Mm -hmm. We can't know the day nor the hour, but mm -hmm. we know enough to know Amen. that it's very soon. It was, that, was that two points, or did, what was it? That was not two. One is the confusion that's oh, the being confusion. shown. The yeah, other yeah. is that Go you ahead. can know the generation. Yeah. yeah. The other part about this is when I first thought about writing a novel, much less a, a series of them, to, to talk and to try to draw people into an understanding of how geopolitical events might connect with Bible prophecy. I was really struggling with that, uh, but I didn't have any other skills, so I, you know, that was going to be probably all I could do. No, I, you know, I'm like the one Jewish guy in America that didn't get the financial gene, you know, and so... Um, so... I'm not a doctor, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not an acupuncturist or an accountant, stockbroker. So I, I, I was gonna write. Now the thing was, living in a political world, you know, I, Lynn and I have been in Washington 21 years, and at that point we've been there 11 years. I thought, Lord, you've gotta be kidding me. Now the thing I'm supposed to do is go from being a failed political consultant to writing end of the world novels? I mean, you're killing me here. <laughs> You know, as though I know better than, yeah, you know, it's just right. so ridiculous. But I mean, but the thing is, I really was embarrassed by it. I, I believed it, but I just didn't want to tell anyone <laughs> in my political world uh, or anywhere else that I believed in these end of days prophecies and what they meant. But you know what's been interesting is, that, first of all, the Lord leading me forward. And secondly, the doors that open that I... I'm just astonished. Uh, for example, Ray and I were uh, doing the Epicenter Conference, the first one in Asia, in the Philippines, and lo and behold, we get invited to go have lunch at the palace with then President um, Arroyo. And we got to talk about the prophecies that Israel has been prophetically reborn. A and we got to talk about Bible prophecy with her and talk about the Lord with her. That, you know... If I, if, I had, you know, if I had known when I was writing the f my first book, oh, and, and someday you'll be sitting in front of a, a world leader talking about Bible prophecy, I might have thought, well, sh sure, I'll sign up for that. Uh, or being uh, w once the, uh, the prime minister of, of Iraq came to Washington to give a, an address to the joint session of Congress. I happened to get invited uh, by a congressional official to go to that speech. Well, that would have been a dayenu in my life. Uh, uh, in Hebrew, that means that alone would have been enough. But then I went to lunch with a friend, and, and we were just talking about the speech and how amazing it was that a, that a leader of rock was leading a democracy. Imperfectly, okay, fair enough, but <laughs> speaking in front of our Congress. I mean, I was actually in the chamber when we voted to go to war back in 1990, uh, late 99, early 91, to go to war with Iraq that first time. So to see him in the chamber was amazing to me. But then I got a phone call saying, the, the guy who wrote the speech, the senior advisor to the prime minister, minister, has heard that you write books about Bible prophecy and was curious if you would meet for breakfast tomorrow to talk about what does the Bible say about the future of Iraq? Hmm. <laughs> I'm like, who is this really, you know? <laughs> I was in Morocco, and I was uh, invited to the home of the top Islamic official at the time uh, in Morocco. And who wanted to talk about Bible prophecy. And, uh, and, and he'd been to my home to talk about it, and now I'd been invited to his home. I didn't invite myself. I wasn't in that mode yet, but, I, <laughs> but he invited me, and I, I, a couple of colleagues, uh, friends who are here today are, were there with me. And he said an Islamic blessing over the food, and, he, and then he sat down and he said, now, this is all very interesting. Now, your name is Rosenberg, right? I said, right. Well, that's Jewish, isn't it? Yes. But you believe that Jesus is the Messiah, that he fulfilled all the Bible prophecies about? I said, yes. Well, how can that be? And I thought, oh my gosh, are you kidding? Right in your home, the top Muslim <laughs> official? This is awesome. <laughs> I, I, I cannot explain except 
don't deny God's call in your life. You are going to miss so much. Aside, I mean, most importantly, you're going to make your Messiah sad. He wants to see you and say, well done, my good and faithful servant. You are faithful with a few things. And I don't, you know, he's not giving us, he doesn't tell us all the things he's going to do. I'm sure that each of your lives, if you'd said, okay, and you're going to, you know, that little congregation in your living room is going to become 14,000 people, and you're going to travel all over the world to preach the gospel, that might, that might have, A, been exciting, or it might have been completely overwhelming at first. And each of your lives are like that. Um, I feel the same way. Look, A, I'm not qualified. B, you've got to be kidding me. Um, and and, I, and if, I, if he told me all the things that were coming, on the one hand, it would have seemed more exciting. On the other hand, I think I would have been catatonic with fear. So uh, be faithful to the next thing that the Lord asks you to do, especially teaching the word properly from the scriptures. You cannot go wrong, and you're pleasing the heart of your Savior. Let's take a few more questions. What do you perceive is the most important prayer point that God wants to bring forward in your sphere of influence at this time? Okay. Well, that's, that's a, I think we'll actually wrap on that question, because so I'll answer it, and then I think that would be good for each of you. And, um, and I, I know there's so many more questions, but I think that's probably going to run the clock. So um, I'm going to go to you first. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I got to think about um, that. We all have to think about that. Yeah, There's know, so much. So I mean, much. Well, yeah, I'm looking. There's four minutes left. So <laughs> I have it's one minute apiece, Ray. Remember that. Yeah. Um, for me, especially in light of the passage that was brought forth that I had the privilege of uh, talking about, about the Holy Spirit being poured out, um, that the, the Spirit <clears throat> is moving. Uh, we don't have to conjure that up. We don't have to make that up. He is moving. <laughs> Find out what, where he's moving and what he's doing and get in the flow with that. Mm-hmm. And for all of us, it, it's a self-assessment. We, we, it's a Romans 12 moment. You <laughs> present your bodies to God, wholly acceptable unto him, which is your reasonable service. Mm-hmm. So it's for each of us assessing, Lord, what do you want? I've heard the message of Joel. I've heard the call to repentance, Mm -hmm. call to righteousness and holiness, and to be your spokesperson, how does that figure in my sphere, my world? You're all going to go back to your homes. This is going to be a faded memory at some point, but but hopefully the Holy Spirit won't let it fade away, that he's going to burn something in your heart and some form of involvement based upon that Romans 12 prayer of how you're going to get involved and call your family, your Bible study group, your church, to prayer, to fasting, to repentance, to mobilizing and speaking for the Lord, and what is your involvement, your next step in blessing Israel and her neighbors? That's the takeaway for me. Mm. Mm. That's good. (laughs) (laughs) I, I echo that. Okay, next, Ann. You know, I think that as uh, as we do offer ourselves as living sacrifices and enter into the, you know, the most powerful thing you can do is enter more deeply into your personal sonship relationship as a son or daughter of God and growing in Christ. Um, he, He wants to bring many sons and daughters into glory. And if we just, as you know, sounds simple, but uh, falling more in love with him and letting our light shine, then when God brings a, 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 either a Muslim into our neighborhood or to our work or a Jewish person, uh, whoever they are, we let our light shine. And we love them. We're not afraid of them or intimidated by them. They're, there's nothing holding us back. And we just glow and, and, and share the love of Christ with them right there. Immediately came to mind was um, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I long to see God's will done on earth as it is in heaven. I long to see Jesus glorified, meaning not 
shining light, but his character revealed in such a way that other people are drawn to him. I long for him to be glorified in my life and in the life of the church. And I've told you all, he has a heart for the Jewish people, and I have a heart for the church. The two of us make up the heart of God, I think, uh, in a special way. But I long for the church of Jesus Christ. And whether it's a congregation or a church, the, the people of, of Jesus who call themselves by his name, I long to see revival happen. And I believe the way to revival is repentance. The way up is down. And so I long to see God's people have an outpouring of God's spirit so that we're convicted of our sin, that we fall on our face before God, we stop pointing our fingers, and we say, it's me, it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. And, and then God, filled with the Holy Spirit, we go out like the early apostles did, and it doesn't matter if you're Jewish or Muslim or whoever God puts in front of us, but that, that we would be filled and, and the place would shake and would go out with boldness and would declare the gospel of Jesus Christ because God so loved the whole world. That includes Muslims and Jews, but also anybody else you can name. He, he has a heart for the whole world, which is why he's just given us Jesus. So um, I long for uh, all of that to come, for Jesus to be revealed. I long for his return and have been longing for it. Somebody said since they were 11, nine years old, I read my Bible through for the first time mm -hmm. and, uh, and came to the book of Revelation and fell in love with the book of Revelation. And, and I've believed since I was nine years old mm -hmm. that I would be a part of that generation. And to see what's coming about is phenomenal to me. So, um, so anyway, I, I believe that God is up to something here and that Jesus is soon to come back and somehow prayer is like a highway through which his will is accomplished. And so we need to pray, however God puts it on your heart, that his will would be done and that Jesus would come back and reveal himself to the world. Preach your sister. Amen. <laughs> wow. <laughs> well, you know, ditto. Uh, to all that. Um, <laughs> only thing I would say is I, I think I spent a lot of my early part of my life, of course I'm younger than you all, but I, my, my <laughs> no, I'm not, <laughs> that's not a bank shot, I'm just saying. I, I mean, it's not that, been as mu that much time that I, but I, I spent a lot of time uh, in my life trying to figure out what was God's call on my life. And now I know, and now the challenge is just to walk with Jesus. You know, it's to not get in love with the ministry more than Jesus. That the schedule gets so filled up that there's no time for Jesus. That we go on a ministry trip and actually you haven't spent any time with Jesus. I, this, is the, the, this is now, and it's, it's easier a little bit, maybe at least in my life, because I have such a confidence or security now in knowing finally why I was born, why I was made, why I'm here. It's all clicked together in a way that I'm just, you know, uh, uh, I can get emotional about. Um, I told the, the, the worship team that uh, uh, the only thing that's gone wrong with this conference is that they did such a good job. I was up there weeping, and I thought, I'm not going to be able to control myself to go out there and speak. So, uh, but I'm very grateful. But we cannot fall in love with ministry more than we fall in love with our master. And, and, that, and, we, and those of us who are at least engaged in ministry can. It's, you know, for a long time, it, we're not... We don't understand the Great Commission, and we're not interested in it. That seems scary. Then we get involved in the Great Commission. We get it, and we get so absorbed in it. And Jesus says in Revelation to some of these churches, I know that you're doing a lot of great things, but you've left your first love. Mm -hmm. And isn't that interesting? That's one of the last things he tells the churches. Look, I, I, your deeds, they're, they're awesome, but your heart is not with me, and you need to repent for that. Just walk with me. I'll do it. I, I, it's all planned out. Don't get ahead of yourself. It's not about you. It's about me. And I, so I, that's my prayer is, Lord, help me, help me, help me keep close to you and hit that tape at the end of the race without it making him ashamed of me. Uh, that's a high calling. And you see so many people dropping around you. We just want to keep our eyes on Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we love you very much, and we're, we're, our minds and hearts are filled to overflowing, and uh, it, this is a lot, I know, for everyone to absorb, but I, I think of your words to your disciples. Uh, there's more to tell you, but you can't bear it now, so I'll send the Holy Spirit to bring these things to remembrance, the things I've told you, and, uh, and, and the things that are to come, and I, I just pray for everyone that your spirit would be working in them, drawing them not into a fascination with prophecy per se, 
but drawing them closer to you as your day approaches. Mm -hmm. uh, may that be a great blessing. And we love you and we thank you for this time. Uh, send us out now with your love and mercy. In Jesus' holy and majestic and powerful name we pray. Amen.